Alright, let's not waste any time. So Sonic Advance 2, as far as controls and moves set, for abilities in this game, we have pretty much everything that we had in Sonic Advance 1. Things have been tweaked a little bit here and there. For example, the Air Dash now gives you much more distance when using it at low speed, which I find makes it much more usable for more situations. The melee attacks are still here, but unfortunately Sonic's melee attack has been turned into just the slide from his three-hit combo that he had previously, meaning that using his melee attack to come to a stop takes quite a bit longer than it did in Sonic Advance 1, making it much less useful than it was in that game, but it's still usable in the same way, so at least the functionality is still there even if it's not quite as good. But uh, on top of all the stuff from Sonic Advance 1, Sonic Advance 2 also introduces a number of new abilities into the game as well. First we have the homing attack brought in from the 3D games, and I could go on a whole spiel about how that's really not necessary because the homing attack was created to aid people with the difficulty of 3D platforming, but this is a 2D platformer which is much easier. But really that whole thing can be summarized by just saying that the homing attack is not very good in this game and you barely ever use it. Another move that's been brought in from the 3D games is Sonic now has the bounce, although it once again works differently than how it does in the 3D games. You don't gain any extra height from using the bounce, instead what you can use it for is as a way to instantly come to a dead stop in the air, and you can also use it to break certain breakable objects in the environment. Not the most useful thing in the world, but it doesn't really harm much by being here, and it does have some applications sometimes. Uh, not a new move, but something I do want to touch on is that grinding is back, and it's still got a lot of the same problems it did in Sonic Advance 1. It's still very fiddly in terms of how you get on a rail. Basically, the way that the game detects you, like, entering a rail is you have to land on a specific part of it that's tagged as, like, the entrance of the rail. If you land on any other part of the rail, then you're just gonna fall right through it. And this just doesn't really feel good when you're playing. It just feels like, why did I just go through the rail? Just land on the goddamn rail, Sonic. What are you doing? So the mechanic still has quite a number of issues in these 2D games. And unfortunately, rail grinding is a much more prominent thing in this game than it was in Sonic Advance 1. So the problem is a lot more prevalent. Uh, speaking of Sonic interacting with objects, another thing I want to talk about is springs, because there has been a quite substantial change to how springs work made in this game, which is that springs now no longer have solid sides to them. In previous 2D Sonic games, the walls, the sides of a spring were solid, and you could run up to them and get stopped on a vertical spring, and on horizontal springs you could stand on top of them. But here, that is no longer how springs work. Now if you touch any part of the spring at all, you're going to get launched by it, which isn't really a good thing or a bad thing, it's just different, it's just something I thought was worth pointing out. Speaking of springs, another feature they've added to the game is tricks have been implemented now, and they are pretty interesting. The way they work is that anytime you get launched into the air by a spring, or a lot of level gimmicks really, like ramps and stuff like that, you can do a trick. And there are different types of tricks you can do depending on the direction you're pressing when you do the trick. You have an upward trick, a downward trick, a forward trick, and a neutral trick, and these will all send you in different directions. If you need to get some extra height, you can use the upward trick. And if you have a spring that launches you way high into the air and you really don't need to be that high, you can cut your ascent short by doing a forward trick, which totally cancels all of your upward momentum. Similar to Sonic Advance 1, we're incorporating more mechanics here that break the concepts of momentum, but I think in an actually good way that adds more to the gameplay. However, as cool as that is, that is absolutely nothing compared to the last new mechanic introduced in Sonic Advance 2, which is the boost mode. This is not like boosting as it appears in many later Sonic games, this is something very, very different. If you're running at your character's default movement speed for a long enough stretch of time, then you will trigger the boost mode, and while you're in this boost mode, your character is going to have these after images following behind them. And while you're like this, you essentially have the effect of speed shoes. Your default max speed is dramatically increased, as well as your acceleration. And this boost mode will last forever, so long as you can keep your speed up. You only lose boost mode if you slow down to a certain point or come to a stop. However, a particular thing about it is it only causes you 
you to lose boost mode if you're on the ground. If you're in the air, you can afford to slow down so long as you gain your speed back before you hit solid ground again, which actually creates for a lot of opportunities for you to get around the game trying to slow you down with the level design. This in particular is one of the great applications of tricks, is there are so many ways where the level will try to slow you down by like putting a spring right up against a wall so you completely come to a stop, and then you slowly accelerate as you fall from the spring, and you would lose the boost state if you just hit the ground normally, but instead you can just use a forward trick, and that will make it so that you hit the ground with enough speed to keep the boost mode going. Not only that, but you can only enter the boost mode when running, you can't trigger it if you're rolling on the ground, which adds a little bit more of decision making into whether or not you want to use spin dashes in this game. One of the criticisms for the spin dash is that it kind of de-emphasizes momentum in Sonic, because you don't have to use the terrain to build and maintain your speed nearly as much, because if you ever get too little speed, you can just come to a stop and use a spin dash to instantly get a huge burst of speed. But, since you can only trigger the boost mode while running, this gives you greater motivation to not rely on the spin dash as much in this game, and instead actually try to use momentum physics and the terrain in order to build your speed, which is pretty cool. And if that wasn't enough, the boost mode also gives a purpose to Pepsi cans again for the first time since, like, Sonic 3 and Knuckles. Because the Pepsi cans in Sonic, their design, their purpose was to be an encouragement for players not to get hit. You would use them to get the Chaos Emeralds, Super Sonic, and Extra Lives. But then once you get to Sonic Adventure and you remove special stages in Super Sonic for the normal gameplay, then there's not really that much motivation to go out of your way to collect Pepsi cans anymore, nor is there really that much punishment for getting hit like they're supposed to be. They kind of just kept the same old system because, I don't know, it's iconic to Sonic, so we gotta have it. But outside of adding to your score, it didn't actually do anything for you in the gameplay most of the time. But Sonic Advance 2 has added a really cool feature where the more Pepsi you have, the less time it takes to trigger the boost state when running at full speed. You can see here that if I do it at the beginning of a level, it takes quite a while for me to enter the boost state. Meanwhile, if you look over here, when I have over 100 Pepsi cans, you trigger it almost immediately once you start running. To me, this is the strongest and best motivation to collect Pepsi that the Sonic series has had up to this point. In every previous Sonic game I've covered, collecting Pepsi was contradicting with the goal of Sonic, which is to try to complete the level as quickly as possible. But here, for the first time, I found myself, when time attacking, sometimes I would actually go out of my way to slow down and collect some extra Pepsi, and it would enable me to trigger the boost state faster and end up completing the level faster than I would have if I didn't go out of my way to collect that. Rather than these two things about Sonic contradicting with each other, pulling you in different directions, for the first time they are actually in harmony now, and I think it works really well. Honestly, I think that the boost mode is the best mechanic added to a Sonic game since the Spin Dash. It just does so much for Sonic. For one, it increases the skill ceiling even further beyond what Sonic Advance 1 was already doing, because ideally you want to trigger the boost mode as early as possible and then maintain it for the entirety of the level, but that is pretty hard to do because of how many things you have to avoid and how many things are trying to slow you down as you run through these levels. Personally, I'm not really good enough to maintain the boost mode for an entire level, but if you watch speedrunners play this game, they get it and they keep it the entire time and they just blast through levels insanely quickly. So it adds an extra layer to getting good at Sonic and completing the levels quickly. It fixes the problem of Pepsi cans not really being that valuable in these games. It's inherently something that is really fun and satisfying because if you can maintain the boost mode for a long period of time, you really know that you're playing really well well and you just feel really cool. You're like, fuck yeah, dude, I am rushing through this game and nothing is stopping me. And also the mechanic I feel is just so perfectly encapsulating in what a Sonic game is all about. They encourage you to try to get better at the game and try to be able to complete it faster and faster. And as you do that, and as you get more access to the boost mode, the game also becomes more difficult because now you're going even faster, meaning everything becomes more difficult to deal with. Obstacles are coming at you faster, you're platforming more quickly, which means you have to do everything more precisely and with better timing. And with this added difficulty just in general, it also means that maintaining the boost mode also becomes more difficult. It's 
it's the entire Sonic game design philosophy encapsulated perfectly in a single mechanic. It's just so good, it's so Sonic. If you ask me, this should become a staple mechanic in every single Sonic game, I just think it is excellent. However, as great as all these new things are, it's not all perfect. One big problem I have with Sonic Advance 2 is that the acceleration from Zero is a lot slower in this game than it was in Sonic Advance 1. You really take a long time to build up from a standstill, and generally I find that the default top speed is a lot slower than it was in previous Sonic games. Once you trigger boost mode or hit a dash pad or something like that, you're totally fine, but when you're just kind of going normally, it just feels like, ah, oh, Sonic, get a move on. I know you can go faster than this. What's the deal, bro? It kind of just makes it so that if you're not blazing forward at maximum speed in this game, it kind of feels just a bit icky. But beside that one problem, I think as far as movement and controls go in this game, Sonic Advance 2 is even better than Sonic Advance 1 was. More of this adding more stuff to the gameplay of classic Sonic, adding on more mechanics, more layers, more depth. I'm all about it. It is so good. Now, as far as level design is concerned, we need to talk about Sonic Advance 2's level design. Because this game is not designed like any of the previous 2D Sonic games. This game is actually designed like a 2D version of the speed stages from Sonic Adventure 2. And I say that as mostly a bad thing. In my Sonic Adventure 2 video, I talked about how the speed stages of that game weren't really platformers. There was very little genuine platforming you did when playing as Sonic and Shadow in that game. Pretty much the entirety of their gameplay was based purely on the speed elements of Sonic. There were a lot of sequences where you just kinda held forward and you would just let the game play itself as you go through automatic loops and stuff like that. Platforming was almost entirely absent from that style of play in Sonic Adventure 2. There was some of it here and there, but it was very, very basic and very, very sparse. And Sonic Advance 2 has taken that kind of approach with its level design and made a 2D equivalent of it. This game has even less platforming than Sonic Adventure 2 speed stages did. You do extremely little of it in this game. This game is all speed all the time, if you haven't already been able to tell just watching the gameplay. You just go, go, go in this game all the time. And this introduces a number of problems into Sonic Advance 2's gameplay compared to previous games. First of all, just the lack of platforming, I think, is just a downgrade, because Sonic wasn't just about speed in the previous 2D games. It was a blend, it was a mix of speed and platforming together. You would use speed for platforming and vice versa. So by removing a large amount of platforming from the gameplay here, we just end up with something that has less going on than the previous Sonic games did. And the result of this is that Sonic Advance 2 doesn't really have much variety in its core gameplay in terms of what you do on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. Previous 2D Sonic games, you would have platforming sequences and speed sections, and these things would weave together with each other, and oftentimes be combined, but in Sonic Advance 2, when it's just all speed all day, all the time, the options for designing challenges for the player become far more limited. It also doesn't help the fact that you go way too fucking fast in this game, which almost seems like something you shouldn't be able to say about a Sonic game, like how could you possibly go too fast in Sonic? But I mean, just look at this fucking game. You are going so insanely fast. And despite the fact that they move Sonic all the way to the far edge of the screen to give you as much visibility as possible, there's still no way in hell anyone can see what the fuck is going on in this game with how fast you move. The GBA's resolution just does not allow for you to get a good look at what the hell is coming your way when you're going this fast. Now granted, this was also a thing in the previous 2D Sonic games, but that wasn't the entire game. There were plenty of sequences where the game would slow you down and have you do some platforming. In Sonic Advance 2, without platforming, this is how the game plays all the time. You're just going insanely fast. Even if you're not moving at top speed, you're still going way too quickly for the player to react to what's coming at them. So if you don't have much platforming to give you something to do when you're going slower, and you're going way too fast for the player to deal with things at more of a medium pace, then the options for challenging the player in Sonic Advance 2 basically get narrowed down to passivity traps is 
really the only thing they have left to do. That gameplay of Sonic where it tries to trick you into just mindlessly holding Riot and letting the level play itself and they punish you for falling into that trap, Sonic Advance 2 is rife with that gameplay. It is all over the place. It's most of the game, actually. And it kind of has to be because there's not really much else you can do when you're moving this fast and you can't see what's ahead of you. It also doesn't help that passivity traps and that whole concept in Sonic games is something that totally flies over most players' heads, meaning they're just gonna constantly feel like they're being thrown with unfair level design where there are just traps and enemies in the path and they had no idea that they were going to be there. And actually, even for a player like me that is very, very experienced with Sonic and really understands these concepts, even I found myself really struggling with the passive traps in this game because of its weird level design. There is a lot more of it that you have to deal with in this game than what you're normally used to in a Sonic game. Most of the time in previous Sonic games, even in 3D ones, when you would have a passive trap, it would be like, okay, there's a speed section here and they're trying to trick you into doing nothing. So you jump or do whatever you need to do to avoid the passivity. And hey, now you took a shortcut, you're on the faster path and here's your reward. You get to blaze through in a speed section. But Sonic Advance 2 doesn't really do that very much. Most of the times when you successfully avoid a passive trap and you're thinking, all right, reward time, now I get to blaze forward at high speed until the next platforming sequence. Well, there is no next platforming sequence. It just is immediately another passive trap that gets thrown at you. And it just happens again and again and again. They come at you with such frequency in this game that it feels like you seldom get really rewarded for managing to predict a passive trap and avoiding it. But also, I found that it was incredibly difficult in this game to predict the level design because along with this large emphasis on passivity traps, the game also takes from Sonic Adventure 2 long sequences of you doing nothing but going forward and going through loops and set pieces and stuff. And so you have this very strange level pacing that's unlike any previous 2D Sonic game where I could never tell if the speed section that I was currently going through was a real one and I should just hold right and let it play itself out, or if I should be trying to feel out for passivity traps, and there were so many instances where I would predict that there's going to be a passivity trap here because of my huge amount of experience with Sonic level design and my understanding of the flow of how Sonic levels are generally made, and this game was just constantly betraying those expectations. Which, on its own, isn't a terrible thing to mix it up and try to catch the player off guard so they don't become too overly comfortable with the formula, but this game did it to such a degree that I found it impossible to understand the level design, and it was just so haphazard and so all over the place and so inconsistent that it, I just felt like, what the fuck is going on with this game's level design? It just feels so fucked up. The legacy skills that I've developed from playing so many previous and future Sonic games was literally fucking me over in this game in particular, and it doesn't happen in any other Sonic game. And it was so bad to the point that by the time I finished my first vanilla playthrough as Sonic in this game, I was like, holy fuck. This game is a disaster. This is a clusterfuck. Oh my god, I can't believe how bad this is. Especially after Sonic Advance 1 was so good, and this game was made by the exact same team. They proved that they understood Sonic level design in Sonic Advance 1, so what the fuck happened here? It's not just a matter of the game de-emphasizing platforming, like the pacing, the flow, the way that these levels are laid out. It's just all wrong, I don't know, I, I, where, eh. I often describe the level design flow of Sonic levels to be that of a song. When you understand how it works and you're familiar enough with how it's put together, you can kind of get a feel for what's about to happen in the level. Like, you know how when you listen to a song and it plays the same bit over and over, adding instruments every so often, and you can kind of feel when it's going to add in the next instrument? That is how Sonic levels are generally paced. You know, they'll have speed sections, platforming sections, and passive traps. And if you understand the flow, then you can feel these things out. But this game's levels feel like they were music written entirely throwing music theory out the window and just doing whatever. So, the core gameplay experience of Sonic Advance 2, I absolutely hated during my first playthrough. And while we're talking about things I hated during the first playthrough, the boss fights. I mean, they've never been very good in Sonic to me. 
but this game gets a special note in particular for having especially shitty bosses. All but the final boss in the game have you running after them on a track, and just like the levels, these bosses are total fucking clusterfucks. They are just so messy, so clunky, the fact that you're running after the boss means that your acceleration is so slow and it just feels like such a pain in the ass. And essentially the bosses all boil down to just waiting for cycles to line themselves up so you can get in a hit, and it just fucking sucks, dude. The bosses in this game are possibly the worst in the entire series up to this point, maybe even worse than 06's bosses. But uh, if that wasn't bad enough, let's talk about getting the Chaos Emeralds in this game, because Jesus Christ, I guess this game just had a goal of making every single fucking thing in Sonic a goddamn disaster. So the way you get access to the special stages in this game is that every level has seven special rings hidden in them. And you hear that and you're like, okay, so I can probably guess how you get the special stages. There's seven zones in the game, probably one per Chaos Emerald. So I just have to find all 14 of the special rings in the zone and then I get access to the special stage. That doesn't sound so bad. Just a little bit of exploring in the levels to find all these things could get a bit annoying. You'll probably have to look up the locations online, but you know, that sounds like it could be a relatively relatively enjoyable experience. And maybe it would be if that's how it worked. If you could, like, play through the level and collect three of the special rings and then go back and collect the last four that you were missing, and then once you get all of them, then you can play the special stage, eh, it probably would be okay. But that's not how it works. No, in fact, actually, you don't have to get all the special rings in the zone. You only have to get all of them in a single level of the zone. But you have to get them all in one run without dying. I, quite frankly, cannot believe this is how you get access to the special stages in this game. So first, you're gonna have to play through the level probably a dozen times to find all these fucking special rings, and it's a miserable experience in my opinion because I already don't enjoy playing this game at a base level. And then, you have to meticulously route out a path where you can collect all of them in one go, because another thing that this game's level design has is many points of no return where if you get past this certain point of the level and you didn't get the special ring that was there, oops, sorry, can't get them all, start over. Honestly, I attempted to do this on the first level of the game, and already I was like, fuck this, I am not doing this because of how much I dislike this game's core gameplay. There is no way I was putting up with that. Thankfully, I found a ROM hack online that reduces the number of special rings you need to access the special stages to just three, which I think improves the process a whole lot, because you still have to do a bit of exploring to find three of them in one go and get to the end without dying, but it's not nearly as much of a horrible, dreadful experience. Jesus Christ, what were they thinking with this? I am willing to bet that 90% of people who played this game as a kid have never even seen one of these special stages. And don't forget, you do this just to get a single attempt at the special stage. If you fail the special stage itself, then guess what? You gotta play the level again and get all seven special rings again. My god, what the fuck? This game fucking sucks. As far as the special stages themselves, I gotta be honest, I think that they are the best in the series so far. I think they're actually really good. What kind of bizarro inverted universe have we entered where, like, I hate the core Sonic gameplay and my favorite part of the game is the special stages? What the fuck is going on? Who am I? Who are you? What's happening? So the way these special stages worked is you're dropped in a Mode 7 arena and there's a bunch of Pepsi cans around and you have a time limit, and in typical special stage fashion, you have to collect a certain number of Pepsi cans before the time runs out to get the Chaos Emerald. Pretty simple, but the thing that makes these special stages fun is that there is a combo system implemented here, where if you collect a number of Pepsi in a certain period of time, then you'll get a multiplier, you'll get a little times two above your head, and during that period, all of the Pepsi you collect will be worth two. And if you can continue to collect Pepsi cans in quick sequence, then that can go up to times three, or times four, or times five, and it can just keep going and going and going. But if at any time during this combo there's too large of a gap between you collecting Pepsi cans, then you lose the entire thing and you have to start over. This makes these special stages a lot more interesting and a lot more fun. During the earlier special stages, it's kind of just like a nice little bonus, a way to get some extra Pepsi more quickly and more easily, but during the later special stages, there's actually
actually not enough Pepsi cans in the level for you to get the amount you need to get the Chaos Emerald, so you have to build up combos in order to get the amount needed, which I think is really cool. It adds an extra layer, an extra thing to think about when it comes to these special stages. There's also an element of, like, kind of planning ahead, because sometimes you might not want to collect certain Pepsi cans, so that way, if you come back to this area, you don't have too large of gaps that you've created for yourself by collecting all the Pepsi in that area earlier and fucking yourself over. There's actually some strategy here that actually makes these special stages really fun. Honestly, my only major complaint with these special stages is that once you hit the Pepsi count that you need, the level doesn't just end. You just have to wait for the timer to run out, and you're kind of just doing nothing. I guess you can aim for a high score here if you want, but I'd kind of just prefer if you could just collect the Chaos Emerald and move on at that point, but not really a huge issue. Oh, and also Zero from SA1 is here, and he's even more useless than he was in that game, so you're never gonna get hit by him. So hey, how about that? Sonic Advance 2 actually does manage to do something correctly. Good on you, game! You had some fun parts in you. And similar to Sonic Advance 1, in order to get access to the Super Sonic Final Boss, you have to beat the game with all the other characters, which, to be honest, I was kind of dreading because I don't enjoy playing this game. And, uh, you know, Tails and Knuckles are here and they play how you would expect, and newly added to Sonic Advance 2 is Cream. This is actually her first appearance in a Sonic game. And she functions similarly to Tails in that she can fly, but also she has Cheese, and Cheese can be used to automatically attack nearby enemies, which, for playing through the levels, is not really very useful because you don't really go out of your way to attack enemies very much in Sonic, but it is extremely useful for literally cheesing the boss fights because you can just hit them without having to do anything you're supposed to do, which is great because the boss fights fucking suck in this game. And then, uh, yeah, Super Sonic Final Boss, it's the same as always, whatever. Moving on. Uh, in addition to having to collect all the Chaos Emeralds and then beat the game with all the characters to get the final boss, you also get something if you collect the Chaos Emeralds with all characters, which I really don't like. In Sonic Advance 1, the Chaos Emeralds were tied to your overall save file, but in this game, you now have to collect them with each individual character, which, while I enjoy these special stages, you just play them again and it's exactly the same with the other characters, so why would you make the player do that? It's just really tedious and repetitive. And the thing you get for it is a playable Amy, which is like, why did you have to unlock this behind a really tedious and annoying thing? Thing instead of just making Amy a playable character normally like everybody else. Very strange. I don't really understand why they did that, but whatever. Oh yeah, and by the way, Amy plays like everyone else in this game. Like, she has the same speed and she can now curl into a ball and everything, because this game's design, she couldn't really play these levels if she played like Sonic Advance 1 Amy. Which is pretty lame in my opinion, because I preferred Amy being more unique and different than the other characters as opposed to just being like everyone else, but it is what it is. So yeah, at this point, I absolutely hated Sonic Advance 2. I thought this game was really, really bad. This is the first Sonic game that I've covered out of the entire series so far that I actually had very little good to say about this game. This one is just straight up bad. I do not like this game at all. I actually kind of hate it. However, we weren't done quite yet because, as always, I had to give the Time Attack experience a shot in Sonic Advance 2. That is the thing that I care most about Sonic, that is the make or break thing for me in Sonic games, and so I had to at least give it a shot, but I did not have very high hopes considering how unfun I just found the game generally. However, to my surprise, I did find Time Attacking Sonic Advance 2 to be pretty fun. It's not great, but it is enjoyable. The raw speed of the game is very satisfying, and by actually taking the time to learn the levels and get really good at the game and learning to play through the levels very quickly, this really gives you the opportunity to really get a feel for the boost mode and really take advantage of it, which is just really fun. So honestly, for me, this is the only saving grace that Sonic Advance 2 has going for it, is that the Time Attack experience is okay. It is the weakest in the entire series, in my opinion, but it's not bad. However, it does have some pretty significant flaws about it that I don't like, especially compared to other games when going for Time Attack. Firstly, another feature that they've added to this game is now all levels start with like a countdown of like 3, 2, 1, go. And if you press forward the moment the level starts, then you get a little speed burst. 
And on paper, this might seem like a perfectly good thing to implement into Sonic. You know, it's like, absolutely, it's like a racing game. You get that little burst of speed as you begin your run. But the thing is, the timing on this is actually pretty tight and easy to mess up. And so all this really ends up creating is this thing where at the very beginning of the level, you end up going, up, oh, messed it up, start over, up, oh, messed it up again, messed it up again, up, oh, messed it up again, up, oh, there we go. Now I can actually do a real run of the level. And then you're playing through the level and you mess something up and okay, back to the beginning and up, oh, nope, nope, start over. Nope, not that one either. Okay, here we go. This kind of timing thing at the start works well for racing games because it's a race, it's competitive, you can't start over if you mess up, you have to deal with those consequences. But in a game where you're trying to get the best time possible, you're just going to restart if you screw it up. So it just adds an annoying thing that you have to put up with at the very beginning of the level. Not a huge problem, but a problem that doesn't need to be there and shouldn't be there. The second major issue that Time Attacking Sonic Advance 2 has, in my opinion, is the biggest one, which is that because the level design is so irregular and haphazard compared to typical Sonic level design, essentially the entire level just boils down to memorization. Now, of course, memorization has always been a part of Time Attacking Sonic games, it's just inherently a part of speedrunning. If you already know what the level's going to be, then obviously you're going to be able to do it faster. However, in all the previous Sonic games, it wasn't purely memorization. Because there were slower sequences, you didn't have to exactly know exactly what to do for the entire level. You could just get to a platforming sequence that was a little bit slower and just do it as quickly as possible. You didn't have to memorize everything, you could just play it. And generally, I found passivity traps a lot more natural, so they were easier to predict, so I didn't really have to memorize those as much either. But in Sonic Advance 2, I had to memorize absolutely everything. Which can still be a fun experience, but it does boil the game down to something simpler than what you get in time attacking any other Sonic game. And the third problem I have with it is that playing as other characters and time attacking using their different abilities for different routes and stuff is really not much of a thing in this game. Because, I mean, just look at how it plays when you're going as quickly as possible. How on earth could I ever find an opportunity to slowly climb up a wall as Knuckles where that would actually be the fastest thing to do? There's really not many, if any, opportunities where the other character's abilities actually allow you to do something different when you're trying to play as quickly as possible. Basically, everyone just ends up playing exactly like Sonic. This game might have five playable characters, but functionally, when you're going for time, it really doesn't. So, Time Attacking Sonic Advance 2 has quite a number of problems for sure, but like I said, it is enjoyable. Not as much as other Sonic games, but I can have a good time playing this game in the way that I normally have a good time playing Sonic games. So, it's at least playable. I will come back to Sonic Advance 2 to time attack these levels every now and then. But I'm certainly not going to be doing any more vanilla playthroughs, that's for fucking sure. This is definitely my least favorite of the mainline Sonic games that I've covered up to this point. There are just so many problems here that I really, really do not like. Not in a flawed way like the 3D games are, where there's parts of it that are good and parts of it that are bad. Just overall, the design of the game is just like, ugh, I don't think that this ended up working out in the way they wanted it to. I think this game is sorely in need of a remake where you zoom the camera way the fuck out so you can actually see what the hell is happening. And like the last video, finally I will touch on the story a little bit. I already talked about some of its story elements, the main stuff with Cream and Vanilla in the Sonic Hero Story video, so I'm not going to talk about those things here. The thing I want to touch on in particular is Knuckles and how he's used in this game, because I have a problem with how Knuckles is treated, and this game is really where that problem starts to crop up. Because you run into Knuckles in Sky Canyon, and he is actually the boss of this zone, piloting the robot that would normally be controlled by Eggman. And when you beat the boss, you realize that Knuckles has once again been tricked into going after Sonic. And this is something that I really just absolutely hate, how much it's used in relation to Knuckles. Like, it to me is just such a fundamental misunderstanding of his character. Knuckles was tricked by Eggman in Sonic 3 and Knuckles because he had spent his entire life up to that point isolated on Angel Island where he had pretty much no interaction with other people. And so he did not understand the concept of a bad person trying to take advantage of him. He was naive and did not know what a bad person was, so he could not identify Eggman as that. 
but after the events of Sonic 3 and Knuckles, he should obviously know not to trust Eggman. Yet in Sonic Adventure, in Sonic Advance 2, in many instances in Sonic X, in the Sonic Mega Drive comic, a little bit in Sonic Mania Adventures, Knuckles has repeatedly over the years been tricked by Eggman, and it's just like, Jesus Christ, this is so fucking stupid. Can we just let this part of Knuckles' character die? Because my god, it's like a thing that they just throw in there because it's part of Knuckles' character that he can be tricked by Eggman. Eggman, and it's so fucking stupid at this point. How could Knuckles possibly believe anything Eggman has to say? That's not naivety, that's just making Knuckles into a stupid character, and I hate it. Uh, but you know what? Credit where it's due. One detail that they actually did get right in regards to Knuckles is that the Sky Canyon Zone, if you look at the game's world map, takes place on Angel Island because it's on this floating landmass here. So they actually remembered that part of Knuckles' character, which is pretty rare. Thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed. If you did and you'd like to support me, there's a link to my coffee page in the description. I'll see you next time.